I wonder, are we really living the life of faith that God invites us into? If we live in a way where we release easily, it puts a demand on the promises of God to continue to provide the supply that he so graciously says that he will. It says, my God will supply all of my needs according to what? His riches and glory. Amen. It says that God will supply everything that I need to do the good work that he's called me to do. Will you invite the Lord to speak to you and direct you and guide you in this next season to say, God, how would you have me to be extravagantly generous in a new way that I have not stepped into before? Because as we do, it requires us to trust fully in him to provide, to supply, and to increase continuously as we move forward. But I would assure you, according to Scripture, that no method that you would take to preserve and protect and to hoard would ever accumulate in a lifetime anything even close to the fullness of the inheritance that God can so easily and so swiftly pass right through your hands and use to bless others and increase that which you are blessed with as well. That's the God that we serve. So number one is that it was God's very best gift. And I just also want to say, God has a way of continuously throughout all of Scripture bringing some of the greatest harvests that the Bible ever records to many who sowed seed in times of scarcity and famine. Not in great years of lots of rain and all of the blessings, but in years of famine and scarcity that sowed abundant seed, God records that some of the greatest harvests that have ever been experienced have actually happened during those kinds of years. Will we believe a world's report or will we subscribe to a higher report that actually carries more authority, that says you can give more away of your time, treasure, and talent, and you'll be blessed more abundantly as you do. And better yet, more people who are hurting and suffering around you will be blessed and experience the love of God as well. God's best gift. Number two is it is a small package but priceless value. Small package but priceless value. We have a way of sometimes mistaking the value of something or what's in something because of the package that it comes in. Would you agree with me? I mean, just this morning, I was getting ready and finishing up before I left the house, and I ran out of cologne. And so I'm looking through the drawer, and we have those little samplers, you know, that you get. They come in the little bitty bottles. And I saw one that was real bright red in the little package. I thought, that's Christmassy. So I'm out of cologne. Here's samples. It's Christmassy. I grab it, sprayed it on, put a lot on, took a big whiff, and I thought, I think I just put on perfume. (laughs) Pretty sure I did. So if you get close to me, I'm just letting you know now. I smell like a woman. Woo, I smell like... No, anyway. I don't know. (laughs) Uh... We have a way of mistaking what's in something because of the packaging that it comes in. Many of our children right now, as we approach Christmas week, in fact, for all of us, we could probably go back in time a little bit in our memories and think about when we were a kid coming out on Christmas Day, and and you see all of the packages and the presents, and don't we have a way of looking and seeing the biggest package that's the widest and the tallest and immediately thinking, that's the one with the most value. That's the present that I want. Whose present is that one right there? It's the biggest box. It's got to be the best present. But can't the value of something many times be misconstrued? by the package that it comes in. And I think about Jesus. I think about the humble entry, the humble packaging, so to speak, that this gift, the best gift that God had to give 
I think about the humble means by which it came. Our Lord, our Savior, born as a child, a baby. He cried. He nursed. He had to have diapers changed. He came into a broken world, fully God, yet fully man, so that he could redeem us to himself. This was not some sort of miraculous, or or I should say some sort of impressive entry by the world's standards of the day. Many people missed it. Yet here he was, God, the word become flesh and walked among us. In Bethlehem, of all places, no coincidence, Bethlehem was a humble town. House of bread is what that means. It was a grain place. The Bible says in ancient prophecy that Bethlehem was little among the other cities in the land in the region of Judea. A humble place. He was in a trough, a manger, something that was used for feed for livestock. We have all of these humble descriptions of the way that this gift came, yet when we step back and we look on this story we can only conclude that there is immeasurable and priceless value to be found in this gift if we will receive it. You see, I think that sometimes when it comes to living generously, we can find ourselves in this mental game at times where we think our gift or our generosity that we may want to release is perhaps insignificant. Uh, there's really, that's not going to make a big difference. Or, you know, that's not much compared to what other people are giving. I, I, I don't know if I, it even makes sense for me to do that. Yet, we have no idea how much a humble gift that we would present Because we want to serve God by releasing what he's blessed us with. We have no idea the kind of value that that might bring to a person who would receive it. Never underestimate that. I've heard so many stories over the years where people would give up a short five or ten minutes of their day unexpectedly to have a conversation with a stranger or someone they barely knew to just kind of pick them up in a moment, only later to find out that stranger was contemplating taking their own life or relapsing back into a serious addiction that could have destroyed them. We have no idea how much value can be realized or received by those that God might prompt us or lead us to give away. I just want to encourage us to be quick to obey to be quick to release, and to live in a way where our hands are very much and arms wide open. If God says it's time to bless, it's time to release, trust Him and watch Him not only refill your cup, but continue to bless other people immeasurably in ways that you may not ever even fully know in this lifetime. But that's the way the God we serve operates. Humble means can bring immeasurable value. And the last point that I want to make is that generosity is a lifestyle. I've learned this over the years, Cheryl, that generosity, it's not so much about a one-time event or a one-time act. You see, generosity is a character attribute of our God which means he's always generous, he's never not generous. And when we are called to live in a way that reflects him in this way, it's a way where generosity is a part of our lifestyle. It goes with us everywhere that we go. God is cultivating this thing in us as we live by faith and are quick to release and obey. And he grows and cultivates this generosity character attribute in us And we begin to live and respond to the things in the world around us out of a place of generosity because that's a part of who we are. It's a lifestyle and not just a particular event that might happen once or here in our life. 
And I think about how the Bible reminds us that those who live generously will experience joy that those who do not cannot understand. There is something about getting to this place where we have no problem letting go of things that it can produce a joy in our lives that we live with that those who cling to things just can't seem to understand. Even the wealthiest people who have, by world's accounts, the greatest numbers of resources that hold tight to the things they own are missing a level of joy that can come from being extravagantly generous. You see, when we're holding on to things, it's almost like the weights on a hot air balloon. It anchors and holds us down in our lives from being able to be moved into the places that God wants to take us. But when we choose to say, I want to be extravagantly generous, God, would you work this thing in me? We let go of everything and don't hold on to things in our lives. And then we become very easy for God to move into the places that he wants to take us. And might I suggest to you, we soar to heights and levels that we can never ascend to if we're anchored in the things of this world. He's calling us to live extravagantly generous. I mean, I see in the scriptures and we read in the Bible again and again that generosity produces joy and people who live this way live joyously all of the time. They're not threatened in that joy by something in the world because the world can't take something from them because they're not holding on to it. And yet we look and we see all of these secular sources that report the same things. I find this fascinating, actually, that Science Daily would tell us that people who are generous are actually happier than people who aren't. Decades of surveys and research and studies have been done by universities to conclude what the Word of God has been telling us since the very beginning. We're finally catching up. <laughs> Time Magazine says that people who are generous live with a kind of joy that people who are not generous never seem to tap into. Nature.com and Medical News Today, I could go on and on and on. It is a scientific principle now, but it's always been a spiritual truth. That as we live extravagantly generous, that there's a joy that just flows through our lives all the time. And don't we need more of that flowing around in our communities right now? You see, guys, these alarming statistics and the suffering and this hurt that we recognize is happening. Can we agree that it's not just some headline in a tabloid that we read about? It's affecting every single one of us. It's in our community right here. People in this room today are probably affected or have been by some of those statistics that I just shared with you today. It's in our neighborhoods it's in our communities, it's in our families, and it's even in our churches. Suffering, hurting, and pain. Yet we serve an extravagantly generous God who has an unlimited supply, who may just be asking in this season that we're in, who will choose to live extravagantly generous by faith and allow me to continue to supply greater levels of abundance that they may be a river irrigating all of the desolate soil around them. You see, we have to subscribe to God's way of thinking in order to live like that, as opposed to the world's way of thinking. I, I wouldn't come at anyone hard right now that is kind of adjusting because of what's going on in the world and say, shame on you, because I understand, I get it, how it would be tempting to think that way. But what I'm saying is now as much as ever is the time for God's people to say, no, I will not subscribe to that limitation and that limited way of thinking. I'm going to continue to subscribe to God's way of thinking and align more with the way he calls me to live than the way the world might suggest I need to live right now. Scarcity and preservation may be what makes sense, but abundance and generosity is what heaven compels us to. <laughs> you see, the world has an economy, but heaven has an economy too, and it is superior. The world's economy would tell us this, five plus two equals seven, but heaven's economy would suggest to us that five plus two 
minus 5,000 and thousands more has a remainder of 12 baskets of fish and bread that are overflowing. And you tap into that economy by way of trust, faith, and belief. And I think God is asking us in this time, will we trust Him to be the extravagantly generous God in our lives that He's always been all along if, we are, if we're honest with ourselves? He was extravagantly generous in the way He gave His Son. And He's asking us to reflect Him in this same way. And the beauty of it all is that He provides the means and the resources by which we can accomplish this kind of life. He's inviting us, I believe, right now to step into this walk of faith. So as we close today, I want you to envision yourself in a particular situation. I want you to think about that you know someone who has a great need and is suffering severely. And you've discovered a way to meet that need. And you're prepared to give up everything in order to help this person. You sell everything you own. You give it all away to be able to pay the price for a gift that you can present to this person that you dearly love to help solve the suffering in their life. You come and you present this gift to them with the joy and smile on your face only to be met by this person rejecting and dismissing this gift that cost you so dearly. We would be heartbroken. Not only for the price that was paid for this gift, but at the rejection that this person presented that denied themselves the opportunity to have their problems and their issues solved. If you can kind of relate to how you might feel in that kind of a situation. Perhaps as much as we could understand, we might be able to relate to how the father feels when someone rejects his son. It was the greatest gift that he could ever give, and he paid the ultimate price to be able to offer it. But like any great gift, we must choose to receive it. And if we'll receive this gift, it will have immeasurable, priceless value that will impact where we spend eternity. And so I just want to ask you today, if you're here or if you're joining us online from wherever you are, if you've never given your life to Christ, you've never surrendered your will to His. You say, maybe you've heard the stories over the years, or maybe you've just kind of been checking this Jesus thing out. But there's something that's been pulling at your heart. And God's been drawing you to Himself and saying, now's the time to respond. I'm going to invite you today to make a decision in your heart to accept Jesus Christ, to make room in your life for Him to come in and take control. It's going to require you to let go completely so that He can lay hold. But if you will, I promise you, it's going to change your life forever. It is the greatest gift that you could ever receive. I'm just going to lead you in a prayer in this moment right now, wherever you are, and it's about the intention of your heart. Give your life to Christ to welcome Him in and to experience eternal life. 
You say, dear Father God, I give my life to you today. I believe that Jesus Christ was born of the virgin, lived a sinless life, suffered and died on the cross, was buried in the tomb and rose from the grave, defeated death so that I could be saved. I put my hope, my trust, and my faith entirely in that today. Would you come to live on the inside of me? God, would you send your spirit to make me new? Would you help me to live with a joy and a peace and a confidence that I cannot know apart from you? Jesus, I give my life fully to you today. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. I just want to encourage you, if you prayed that prayer, if you made a decision for Christ today, wherever you're at, we want to connect with you. We want to help you take next steps in this journey of faith that you're on. God has a promise and a purpose for your life. He wants to use you uniquely to be a game changer in this world for him, and he will empower you to be able to do that. One of the ways he does is by surrounding you with great men and women of God who can help you walk through this life that he calls you to. We would love to be able to assist you in doing that. So on that note, once again, everyone, Merry Christmas. May God bless you. May his favor go with you. And may we be a people who continue to live extravagantly generous in a hurting world. Amen. Hey, we've got a fun Christmas song that we're going to go out of here with, so let's stand to our feet and let's enjoy this together this morning.
Amen. Well, there's joy in the house this morning. There's joy in the hearts. Take that with you today as you go. Take that joy, that love, that peace with you and share it. Remember, God is the reason for the season this year. And on behalf of every pastor here, myself, the Worship X team, everyone in attendance and online, we wish you a Merry Christmas. Very Merry Christmas. Remember this. It doesn't remember what ugly sweater you, you get, socks you get, or if a gift card from Pastor Matt. <laughs> You've already received the best gift you'll ever get. Amen. Merry Christmas. Merry